welcome back. I hope you had a good break. So we've got five more classes, including this one. Um, I just want to run through the schedule real quick. If I set a due date for homework four, I've just said after Thanksgiving, right? What did I say the date was? December 1st, that's coming up. So I think I'm just gonna switch this around a little bit, give you a little bit more time. This might be needed by a few of us that are working pretty hard this week. So I wanna um, ease some of the burden here. I'm gonna make this December 6th, right here. This is the last day of class. <coughs> This homework is basically implement everything that you worked out in the previous homework. So we can do another review session if you need a reminder on what the full conditionals look like. So it kind of requires you to write down a bunch of full conditionals. The way I always do it is I write down the sampling model, what the joint sampling process is. Every time there was kind of a stochastic thing, a random thing, there better be an element like that in my sampling function, a function. So those functions represent stochasticity. And so when we see a bunch of stuff happens, I'm making a big product. Then I think about that as the likelihood function. I plug in my data. And then I kind of see where the parameters are in that likelihood function and how it factorizes out. And then I multiply that piece by the prior. So remember there's only one prior. So that's only touched once. So if you want to think of it as um, the way probability works is somebody reached into this prior distribution and grabbed the parameter out and then created the sampling function under that parameterization, that's a good way to get into an argument. Because <laughs> you know, I don't think that that mimics reality. So the way I like to think about the prior distribution is it regularizes the space in some way and induces properties in my posterior distribution. It makes it sound like I'm an objective Bayesian, that I'm only looking at properties. So somebody that was an objective Bayesian might say, hey, look, I want certain properties. I want transformation invariance, or I want um, location invariance. And so you'd have good reason to go use Jeffrey's property. You don't even have to think about it. You just compute the thing. So and I've got these objective principles for doing it. I'm an subjective Bayesian. Just to let you guys know, I understand I've already lost the argument when I say that. So because I'm dealing with people and they're irrational. So, but what I mean is I choose objective criteria subjectively. I think about if they make sense. If there was information that I wanted to encode in my prior and kind of say the parameter value is around here and I'm going to try to hone in on it. That's also a subjective way of thinking and most people would call that subjective Bayes, but I think of it all as subjective Bayes. We make our choices and you have to back those choices up and you're the statistician and you're going to check to see if those choices really impact your analysis. And so, anyway, um, I'll leave it at that. Um, I want to come back to this problem right here in a minute, but um, you're going to have to go through that rat problem, code it up. I say try to find the priors that they used in the paper, and that could take you a long time. I did have a quick question about the rat problem. So in the paper, they go through and do the predictive distribution. Yeah. So should we also be doing that? I don't, th I don't need you to do that. All I want you to do is just do the parameter estimation. Now, the predictive distributions are cool too. So let me say this, if you do them, and do something extra, indicate it to me. So if you're on the boundary of grade, I can look at that and say, let me give this person a little bit of a nudge. So if you want some extra credit, do a little bit more on that. I would say the, the bare minimum for the rat problem is to pick some priors based off of what you saw on the paper, encode them up to your interpretation of what they said in the paper. They do have everything on a different scale. I've tried to talk about gamma, inverse gamma, stuff like that, and going back and forth between them. They are the same parameters, but make sure that rate scale is on the same scale you're interpreting on, because it might be upside down. So those are all things that you need to do, and see if you can recreate the results. And if you can, amazing. So, and if you can't, instead what I'd like you to do is change those hyperparameters and show how it impacts your result. And I think everybody should do that. 
that. I think they should have done that too. Um, Jared, what will we find? I don't know if that Jared. Yeah, totally. So it is a very subjective analysis in there. They have reasons. I didn't quite understand all their reasons for their parameterizations. I really do think that they're just illustrating the utility of a Gibbs sampler and a joint analysis. And I would say that's probably one of the, the biggest benefits of being a Bayesian is doing that full-blown joint posterior analysis and you've got all these things in there and you're jointly controlling all that stuff. I think that's cool. Um, their exact analysis, I'm not quite sure. So what's the overarching um, point of their analysis? Maybe when I first talked about it, I said maybe you're looking at this correlation parameter between the rat's initial weight, or at least a proxy for it, and their propensity to gain weight or take off weight. And if that's positive, then if the rat came in heavier, they would put on rat faster. Than a rat that was lighter that would put on weight smaller. That's what correlation means in a linear sort of way. And so they come up with uh, an answer and see if you can, you know, re-derive that and see if under these different parameter settings you always get a positive term or a negative term. So we're basically arguing over a sign in the um, correlation matrix, the covariance matrix, the off-diagonal terms. And so, and I think in that sense, maybe their analysis is okay. So that they're probably pretty sure that that correlation parameter between the, the rat's initial weights and their propensity to put on weight through the time series, so through time, um, it's probably positive. So come in bigger, probably put on weight faster. You could argue it the other way. There are cases where it could go the other way, and that's noise and data and variation between beings. So and I think that's cool. So, See um, how much it matters, how much your priors impact everything. So the minimum thing is basically coded up. You've got a couple full conditionals. It couldn't be easier to code this thing up as long as you've got the parameters in those conjugate models figured out. You're sampling from gammas, you're sampling from normals, you're sampling from um, wish art or inverse wish art, depending on how you parameterize it. Well, that was another thing. Um, so I know obviously in that lab in R, I have to take wish art samples. But the paper does describe a method of using gammas to yeah. do the wish art. You don't have to do that. Well, you can use a belt in. Okay. So, but I, I would agree, like back in the day, there was no wish art sampler sitting there in MATLAB or R. You know, MATLAB did exist back then, but it was a different thing altogether. There was no crayon, there was no crayon running around, and there were none of the, the MATLAB repositories. That stuff just didn't exist yet. So you had to tell people how you actually did all this stuff. Just use one of the built-ins. That's what I recommend. If you want to code it up, let me know. I'll give you some benefit of the doubt to come final grade time. So if you feel so inclined, I don't know if that one would be super worth it. So in the term of, in terms of prioritizing our, our time, maybe that one's not. But good catch. So um, so that's what you're doing here. The, the Cauchy regression thing, you should be getting back is the slope in that um, regression model. At the end of the day, you should be getting back something like the correlation parameter that you generated all the data with. And so um, if you have trouble thinking about that, talk to Joe Sai, he's teaching stat one one these days, and could explain all of that to you, what that parameter is. So. Different ways of thinking about the exact same thing. Okay. Um, any other questions about what we need done on the upcoming homework? Okay. We'll do another review session. So I'll say review this Thursday at 6 p.m. Same location that we've been doing it all semester. In fact, I think I have that piece of paper right here. Two of them. Hutch. I'm concerned about the environment. So that's my feeble attempt at making a difference. Um, homework five. Let's let this be due at the final. That was already determined. And this is on December 13th. I don't remember the time, but it's on the syllabus. 
Um, it's not one of the super early ones, I don't think. So does anybody remember what time? It's 10. Okay, 10 o'clock. I love that time to give up. Gives you a little bit of time to, to prepare in the morning and set your ease. What I'd like to do for this is for the last couple of years after the pandemic, I've been giving a take home final. I just don't find them super productive in terms of what you're doing with your time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to give you that take home final on the last day. I'm gonna let you look through it and study from it and I'm gonna sample a couple questions out of it or very, very similar to it. So it'll give you a study guide So for what's coming up. So I'll email that to you um, on the last day of class, the sixth. I'll show it to you, we'll walk through it on the last day. That's not this Wednesday, that's next Wednesday. And then I'll sample a couple questions and I'll give you some hints. I just want you to go through the motions of taking a test. So, but it's not supposed to be that grueling thing that makes you worry a ton. So I think we can all relax about what the pace is and what the expectations are. Um, on the final homework, it's due at the final, all you have to do is encode the SSDS stuff. I don't need you to do lasso. I don't need you to do ridge, even though ridge has got to be the easiest thing to do. And with all the built-in facilities, lasso is pretty easy to do, but I'll, have, I'll talk about them. And if you want to do those, I'll give you extra credit. So if you want to do those versions of the problem, what I want you to do is just the stochastic search variable selection algorithm. And it's an implementation of this base factor in high dimensional space. So you're basically just checking if data is in the model, the regression parameters are zeros, which is very similar to this sort of problem right here. Keep in mind in a standard normal regression, it's not Cauchy, I could have made it all Cauchy to make the problem a little bit tight to other stuff, but I wanna give you a chance to actually solve the problem. So and not have to debug everything for three weeks before it's finally working. So I do know how it is. Sometimes this takes a little while to build the architecture and get everything connected and debugged. Um, I'm gonna tell you what the base factors are for doing the regression problem. So you might have something like this. Yi's are equal to sum of the beta j xi's right here. So I'll just, I'll write down that way. J goes from one to p. So forgive me, one of those is an intercept in the model. And I'll just put these in XIJs right there with, I've got some air eyes in there, right there as well. So this is a typical regression model and the basic question is a beta J equal to zero and that would mean that covariate. So the XIJ for all the eyes has no impact on the variability of the Y's. So in a linear sense, so there's lots of assumptions built in. And so whether or not you should fit a model like this is usually questionable, and that's what a whole exploratory class in statistics is about, is whether or not you should even do this. I guarantee you the data that's on the website that you're gonna be tested was generated out of a model like this. I did put in some interactions into um, some of the terms. So you're gonna have to format the X matrix. So I give you the basic covariates, but there could be covariates that are multiplied into each other that generate the Ys. I don't give three-way interactions, so again, it's feasible to solve this problem. Um, you'll basically be able to see all the tuning parameters in your base factors and see how that impacts the results, and that's what I want you to basically explore. So I'll be walking through that for the next three or four days the last days of how you actually implement that homework. But again, it's gonna be very simple um, in terms of the implementation. The theory is what we'll have to spend some time unraveling. So I think we're on pace to finish relatively smoothly in the class. Okay, let's get back to this. So I wanna just quickly talk about the paper. So the paper that we've been talking about by Mark Shervish. It's one of my favorite papers. I really like it. P values, what they are, what they are not. They make a point in this that p values are not a measure of the null hypothesis. 
So, and I've already made that point in the sense that I said, if you're testing a one-sided hypothesis, you know, where you're bounding things by theta naught, theta is less than theta naught, you get a p-value of p, it's called p star. And then I say, ah, instead of doing the one-sided thing, I want to do the two-sided thing, I want to test if theta naught is the correct value, not anything to one side of that interval, the p-value that I would compute is 2p. And so I've reduced the size of the space, the hypothesis that I'm testing, and the p-value got bigger. It's not a measure. As you make the space bigger and bigger and bigger, the measure should get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so what really happens is that the measure does some really weird nonlinear things. And that's what they're pointing out in this paper. So um, p-values are not a measure of the null hypothesis. Neyman and Pearson were basically saying if you pre-specify alpha and you did all of this and all the data was generated under these actual models, we just don't know the parameterization of them, um, then you can have error control, type one error calibrated by alpha and uniformly most powerful, the lowest type two error if you follow the Neyman and Pearsonian thing, which is basically bounding the likelihood ratio test statistic. So it's basically just air control. The p-value cannot be interpreted, interpreted in general as a measure of the hypothesis. So they tell you in this basic problem, so they look at, they're gonna make this really simple. They're gonna say your observed data set is x. It's just one value. So it's some number. They're gonna be generating everything from a normal model and that normal model is just going to be normal. I called it theta. They call it mu in this paper. I think we can adjust. It's got a variance pre-specified of one. So that's pretty easy to deal with. So I can use one data point to do the estimation. It's not great to do that. So if you wanted to change this paper and use more data, you'd be using x bar. And instead of one, you would use one over n as the variance, or one over square root of n is the um, standard error. So it doesn't really change anything. Their point is still their point. Then they walk through basically some stuff we've learned in um, stat 101 type classes that the p-value for testing um, mu naught at a point, which is my theta naught, is two times this cumulative, which is the p-value. If you're testing a one-sided thing, it's just the cumulative probability. And we've drawn some pictures of that. If you've ever taken any stat class ever, they had you doing this. So then they show you for the interval test that the p-value is this. They don't drive this for you. They tell you where you can find this result. But this is the uniformly most powerful test coming from the likelihood ratio test statistic. So. And if you want to know more about that, you take a stat inference class at the grad level, and they would derive all that stuff for you and show you that it's uniformly most powerful, i.e. the lowest type 2 error. The p-value is just these two cumulatives that are being added together. So and that's what it is. Mu1 and mu2 um, are the, the interval bounds. So this is the interval thing. And it kind of makes sense that if you add it together, two cumulatives, and put them to the same point, you would come back to two times the, the cumulative, you know, where both of those points are converging to the same point. So the bounds are converging to the, whatever that interior point is. And so that's what it is. Basically, you're just adding together two p-values. The uniformly most powerful test is testing how close you are to those two endpoints. You're just adding together those p-values. Does anybody know which paper you can find this in or which book? Right there. It's not me. <laughs> Doesn't it's not spelled like mine either. That's the more traditional way. So here are the p values that they write down for the interval test. So you can just kind of take that for granted and accept that Eric Lehman's a pretty smart guy. He derived all of this. Mark Shervish is a pretty smart guy. He probably checked all of this. I've checked it and done the calculation. That's right. So um, this is the corresponding p-value that leads to the uniformly most powerful test. And then they give you some results. And you might want to read through this. But basically, if you end up setting this up and they give you some numbers in the paper, that if you come up with a p 
p-value and you pick some values right here, I'll just call this theta 1, theta 2, and I come up with some corresponding p-value, they show you that if you increase this interval a little bit, this p-value goes down, and then you increase this a little bit more, it goes down, which is weird. And then you increase these things a little bit more, and a little bit more, and the p-value starts going up. And that's what the numbers are showing you. So it's weird. So, and I have this set completely overlapping the old set. So the hypothesis that you're testing completely subsumes the other hypotheses. So it's not shifting the interval, it's just expanding the interval. And that's weird, and it should go in one direction or another. I have had people vote on which way it should go. If you want to see some um, comic relief at the end of the semester, you can go to one of the old classes and see us all kind of argue whether or not the p-value should go up or down. I argue that the p-value, if it were a measure, should go up if you keep expanding that interval. One thing I think we could all agree on, it shouldn't go down and then up. So that's not a measure. So that's what the whole point of the paper. So they tell you that p-values for this sort of test, or the interval test, the interval test itself is really heinous, interpreting that p-value. That's probably why they've never taught you about it. A Bayesian test, you set up the posterior distribution, you use whatever prior you want to use. You could even use an improper prior, and you just measure the area under the posterior in that interval. And if that interval got bigger and bigger, the measure would get bigger because everything is positive that you're adding. So that's coherency and that's additivity. So the Bayesian argues you have to have that. And this is probably the biggest argument between Bayesians and non-Bayesians. Um, all the AI people, the machine learners, they do not touch this stuff. They don't do testing like this. Okay, they do do some A-B testing. It is the same sort of thing, but they probably do things in a sensible interval sort of way. So um, I'd say that's probably to their benefit that they're not still having this argument over the utility of the p-value. I would say with a p-value, if you had a well-controlled experiment and you had computed a sensible effect size that you wanted to measure and be able to distinguish, is it this value or is it this value? Something bigger than that value. And I had a well-controlled experiment. I had power calibrated up front, so I had N selected in advance how many samples I was gonna get. And I had air control built in, and I pre-specified an alpha level that I wanted to stick with, and I always repeated this process like you would do in a quality control setting, maybe. So you have a conveyor belt and you're measuring, is there a difference? So and I want to be able to sound the alarms appropriately, not too often, but when there is an actual difference, I want to sound the alarm and say, stop the conveyor belts, let's check the process. So quality control 101. A p-value thresholding by alpha is a good idea. So no problem, I don't have a problem or an argument with what David Pearson have done, what most people do is they go out and collect a bunch of data and compute a p-value. What they're probably doing is just rejecting their basic model assumptions, you know, not even the hypothesis itself. So it's probably even worse than the case that they're making here. Um, I think we should get away from this. We should probably stop doing this, but what we're going to do um, is at least study the dynamics of this problem, and then you can make your decision for yourself. So this is the paper. All you really have to read through is probably down to um, this last paragraph right here, and maybe right over here. So probably just the first two pages. It's not going to be on the test, but I want you to just be aware of where this is. And if anybody says, what's this p-values are incoherent thing, you can come to this paper. And that's the argument. Um, Bayesians have other problems. So they're not, they're not problem free. Let's explore. I made a false promise of a quiz today. We're not gonna do it. So, but I assume you'll know how to impute this thing that we're gonna talk about in a second. Josiah. If one of the problems um, with frequency serving is specifying a model which makes perfect sense, 
Are, are you also struggling with that with the baby because you've got to select the model? Yeah, I think so, to some degree. There's something called epsilon contamination. People have explored this. They say if your model's a little bit off, who's going to get bad results first, the Bayesian or the non-Bayesian? And so Jim Berger's work, extensive through the late 80s, on the Bayesian does much, much better. And the reason why is because when you compute the Bayes factor, whatever your model assumptions are, they're in both the numerator and the denominator of the model. So they're kind of balancing e each other, so at least you've treated it equally in the null and the alternative. And that kind of makes sense. So um, it does cause problems.